Welcome out there. My name is Laulu Akonde and you are on to Inside Sources. And here is my take for today. Since it is the mission of Inside Sources to promote the public interest, good governance, transparency, and accountability, we raise critical issues where we find them, and we don't ignore the delivery of public goods when that happens. So today, let us praise some commendable developments that we have seen in our country recently. Number one, we must acknowledge that the central bank governor, Mr. Yemi Kadoso, at least in the immediate term, has been able to stabilize the value of the Naira. Now, some people have said he's using the foreign reserves to defend the Naira. For whatever it is worth, we must commend the fact that the wanton free fall of the Naira has now been altered. What should follow in the mid to long term is a deliberate calculated action from the federal government to seriously review our importation excesses. And we made this point last week. Both the private and the public sectors also need to activate non-oil exportation seriously. Secondly, in terms of commendation, let us also commend the student loan scheme that was launched recently. Now, what President Bola Ahmed Tinubu has done in this instance is to show an exemplary model of the salutary use of political power. When the first version of the Student Loan Act was hastily passed and signed, it had a number of obstacles that made nonsense of the whole idea. But we must commend Mr. President because he went back and ensured that those defects in the earlier version of the Loan Act has been corrected so that the obstacles ahead of potential beneficiaries have now been removed. Mr. President, big kudos. Acting this way, sir, is exactly how a government leader should deal with all the major issues of the day that is confronting us and that is causing Nigerians to suffer. Do just like you have done. Remove whatever the obstacles are, and whoever is an obstruction should be removed. Just make things work for the Nigerian people. Thirdly, we must celebrate with ourselves on the success of a direct flight from Lagos to London by a local airline. All Nigerians should celebrate this. It's a big deal. And not only are we going to commend Airpeace and the resilient chairman, Mr. Alan Uyama, but we must also praise the Minister of Aviation, Festus Keyamu SAN, who has been working hard to sort out some of these things. And we urge him, don't relent. This is a very good development, and it brings cheer to our nation. The federal government must now do everything it takes for this national joy to abide. Meanwhile, any way to reduce the fears of our local flights will compound this thing of joy so that it comes to joy to the fullest. Finally, we must talk about the electricity tariff hike. For about two decades, we have struggled as a people regarding the power sector. Both government and the private sector have not been able to solve the confounding problems in the industry. Indeed, there are serious challenges in that sector. But the point to be made today is that the consumers cannot and should not have to be the ones to suffer for the many intrigues and contradictions in the power sector. If they pay for a service, they must get the service and estimated billing must come to an end. Some of the recent utterances of the new Minister of Power is unacceptable. It is so important for us as a people, not just government, but I'm talking of a whole society approach to take a fresh look at the problems in the power sector. All said, at the end of the day, the reason why the people in government have power and authority is for them to solve the problems for the people that elected them. And so any decision or use of government power that does not ultimately deliver a good or yield a satisfactory dividend to the Nigerian people is a waste of power. 
And this is what we will continue to talk about here to encourage those in government to use the power that they have for the benefit of all Nigerians. Because the welfare of the Nigerian people and their security is the reason why you have the authority in the first instance. You don't have the power for sure, and you don't have the power for your private or personal fancies. And there you have my take for the week. So my first guest today is a major ally of the president in the days they were in the trenches fighting military and clamoring for democracy. And also we have a second segment that you will find very exciting. Inside Sources, we'll be right back. My guest today is one of the more eminent Nigerian politicians, especially during the Second Republic, an active party organizer uh, who has also remained a notable figure of NADECO and uh, other eminent uh, associations that have been pushing for democracy and pushing for restructuring and devolution in Nigeria. I'd like to welcome today to Inside Sources, Mr. Hayo Opadokun to Inside Sources. Good afternoon. Thank you, sir. The first question that I would like to ask you is, if you look at where Nigeria is today, can you say that we are on course to a great Nigeria that people like you have articulated and you know, the vision that many of us Nigerians have? Do you think as things stand today, Nigeria is on course to that greater uh, greater Nigeria. If what you are saying is whether Nigeria is on course, yes, I will say regrettably that Nigeria is not on course. Okay, so so why do you say that, sir? In all ramifications, so, say social, economic, and political matters. In fact. Rather than being a developing nation, we are an underdeveloping nation. And Nigeria has been a great test disappointment to the black race who have looked up to Nigeria to today for leadership. We have been a abysmal failure because we cannot govern, govern ourselves, so we cannot provide leadership to the black world. Okay. In spite of the fact that Nigeria is endowed with natural and human resources, those who have captured Nigeria as their private enterprise had subverted the hopes and the aspiration that Nigerians had at independence. Much more guilty in this wise is the fact that the institution called the Nigeria Army, which staged a military coup d'etat and violently overthrew Alaja Abubakar Tafa Balewa's government on January 15, 1966, has been, has been most guilty of all subversion that are taking place in the country. By that military push, the military subverted, stunted our growth, arrested our growth, and reduced us to nothingness since then. In fact, what could be regarded as the article of faith that bind the various ethnic nationalities together called the Federal Constitutional Arrangement, was abrogated and suspended on January 15, 1966, and the sub and substituted for it series of military decrees from Decree 1 to 9, up, 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 to, up to the rest of them, to centralize and unitarize Nigeria to today. And because of that, 
Nigeria has not been able to find us fit. And I, I, yes. I, I get your point about the, uh, the role of the military um, in, in, in subjugating the democratic uh, development of the country uh, in 1966, you know, and then later in 1984. Now, the military has since left power since 1999. So, so this year is 25 years after the military has left power. What is left to be done uh, uh, between now and then, in your view, that has uh, made us not to be, to be in the proper place? I hope you are, I hope you are not under a wrong, wrong, wrong understanding of the, of the chemistry of what the whole thing. This, this so-called so 25 years, who are the prime movers and shakers of, of, what are the, of, the, of the situation? Because we, we succeeded in pushing the military back to the barracks, they went on their own terms and imposed upon us their former commander-in-chief in the person of General Obasanjo, who ruined Nigeria. Give me just one thing that Obasanjo did to promote democracy, democratization, and democratic features in the country. In the, in the country. Everything, most of what he did were all anti-democracy. Uh, uh, directing, shooting at sites of innocent people. And when we cautioned him that no reasonable investor will bring his money into a, a country where people can be, could be shot at sites. He had no, he had no regrets. Look, when the man in Zamfara started the Sharia, we told President Obasanjo that Nigerian law ought not to permit for his, a, another constitution. He said it was a political Sharia. 12 states in the north took after him. What is the resultant consequence today? We have two laws in some, in some part of the country and they could get away with anything. In fact, the so-called uh, um, Sharia, Sharia uh, police, they could, go, they could go ahead to destroy the bottle of, of, of beer sold by some people in their, in their, in their, in their different states. And yet, the value-added tax that are collected from taking of beer they are willing, they are ready, eager to share part of that thing, part, part of that, part of the vat. Unashamedly. I've never seen a thing like that. Mm. And when Obasanjo was going to leave, rather than allow democracy to thrive, he looked for somebody whom he knew that was medically challenged. He wanted to be governing us by remote control. And because that fellow, as it will happen, all of, all of us are human beings. The, 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 it never, never lasted anything. And the money we went to, to bring at the pain of death, called President Dr. Jonathan, Jonathan took over. And because that one also will not listen to him, eh, he went on the offensive him. And then the next person who was going to govern was another former commander-in-chief of the army named uh, General Muhammad Buhari. So what are you talking about, about, about democracy that civilians have been, have, 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 have been governing Nigeria? The, 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 the military that are taking over since General Refuting 1966 are still in control of the system. So they don't, we, we, people like me are not, we will not be deceived. We are not deceived at all. Okay, so uh, you, you know, your, your point is well made. Uh, so now we have uh, in the office uh, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, uh, who clearly has no uh, military antecedents. So what do you think should happen going forward so that we can put this country on the right trajectory? Well, I believe that 
President Bola Tinumbu has all that it takes to do the right thing. The most important business that he has to do is to return Nigeria to a federal constitutional governance. We secured our independence under a federal constitutional governance. But the military, having subverted, abrogated, suspended that constitution, and unitarized and centralized governance, they have, in the process, made Nigeria to operate policies that produces inequity, injustice, discrimination of, of, various, of, of various kinds, and disobedience, flagrant disobedience to the rule of law. Mm. So I believe that if Nigerians are up to ensure that gov gov those who are in government perform, President Bola Tinubu, who was part of us in the trenches, have no other abandoned business or most important business to do than to restore Nigeria to a federal constitutional governance. And more to reach, he, he has another advantage that his own party in their own manifesto, Article 7 of, the, of his party's APC manifesto, enjoys them to return to, to restore Nigeria to federal constitutional governance. I admit, admit that the state of the economy is unbelievable, intolerable. The, the death of poverty and deprivation that is in, in our country today cannot be tolerated further. Mm. I believe that he has the technical and, and knowledge and expertise to quickly enunciate, initiate, and implement socio-economic policy that can uplift Nigeria out of the current doldrum that we have. For example, his efforts over natural, natural gas ought to have borne fruition, ought to have given hope to Nigerians by now. It ought to be to have been worked through that Nigerians will not be paying such heavy sum of money that that pay they are paying to fed their to fed their vehicles. And as a result of 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 of, of the so-called unprecedented uh, um, hike in, in petroleum and, and diesel, food remains costly and everything is above the uh, average span of the ordinary man. I believe that he could do that. But all, all those things with the bread and butter politics, the most important thing is for him to invite ethnic nationalities, leaders, to sit down together, we have the 1963 Constitution in a, in a, in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a, available. Then the pro democracy constitutional conference drafts, which he was part of, is available for us, mm. so that we can sit down together within, within without without wasting time, and restore Nigeria to federal constitutional governance. That is when we would say that Hore, mm. Daniel has come into judgment. One of us who had been, who has been with us in the trenches had, had come to right the wrong that have been wrong to, 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 uh, against Nigeria in the last 40, 40 years or so. Mm. And, and, and certainly, uh, uh, Mr. Kwaloku, I, I, I also shared uh, those sentiments and old how the hope uh, that President Tinubu will actually uh, be able to, uh, to, to give us uh, a, a, a true federal constitution. But let me ask you, sir, what is the best way of doing that? Uh, is it through uh, the president sending a, a bill, an executive bill, 
to the National Assembly. I have the glory to pronounce uh, documents. You know, the, the, the Pronaco uh, recommendation. Right. Yes. No, I'm, so I'm, I'm now asking you, do you right. think the president should convoke another formal conference or should the president just put together all the available uh, uh, documents and recommendations, uh, some of which he was a participant, and send an executive bill for a new constitution to the National Assembly? How do you think the president should proceed? My 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 recommendation is that be, because when the British came, they related with the ethnic nationalities, not with any other group of people. President Tinubu should now call the ethnic nationalities and their leaders. And let us have together this 1963 constitution, the Pronaco document, and any other document that might be of relevance. Let us, those ethnic nationality leaders and those who have been dealing with these matters are more capable. They will be of greater use than a jamboree and then so that we can then sit that together with him then after having produced the a, 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 a worthwhile uh, a, 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 a draft constitution which he can send as an executive bill that would be, uh, be what i will i, I will i will so suggest okay uh, 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 thank you for that point um i, I want us, us to also discuss you know, still on the future of Nigeria, the role of political parties. I know that uh, you were one of the leaders uh, in the organization of, of, of parties, especially in the Second Republic. You played a major role, especially in the Second Republic that we all know, uh, in the organization of the UPN. So I wanted to ask you two specific areas in the area of recruitment of leadership in the parties and in the area of funding the parties. What insights can you give us when you compare what happened in the Second Republic and what is happening now? So, so yes, what I, 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 I don't, I don't want to offend any, anybody, but I, I, I must say with all sense of responsibility, that since the military adventure in, into political governance as initiated by Babangida, called Babangida politics, they've totally subverted the essence of party politics and its management. In the First and Second Republic, Party apparatchik were in control of the management of the of the party at the office. For example, all officers elected normally don't operate at the party headquarters. Mm. They come in occasionally to transact their businesses and then they go away. For example, we had a director of publicity and research in the Second Republic called Chief MC Chika Ajiluchuku. We have a director of organization called Chief Ebenezer Babatokwe. who people like me assisted as assistant director. So we were in charge of running the party. When the party gives directives through the elected officers, we carried those directives into op op operations. But today, 
what the military politics have done is that people, the so-called elected people, were the ones sitting there in offices throughout. And that's why you have the, the, the crisis that you have. And because they were parasitized, created by the Bangladesh government, called political parties, you couldn't expect much from them than what you now have. The situation where the political parties, manifestos and constitutions were written by the same set of people. Just one to the right, one to the left. And so there are no, no difference, no ideological background upon which each party was going to base its activities, its understanding of socio-economic and political matters upon. And that's what has, what, what has happened. For example, uh, in this uh, military politics that they are, they are going through, what you find is that most of the things have been so unitarized and centralized to the extent that they, they, have, they, they, they hardly had, have any added value from anybody. Let me tell you that one, one of the evil, evil, evil leftovers of the military in their centralization and unitarization of Nigeria is the fact that when they were going to leave, uh, General Murtala Mohammed, when he selected and picked some people whom he called wise men, he, 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 he gathered about 50 to, together. But Chief Obafemi Awolo rejected his offer. So he, 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 he remained 49 under the leadership of Chief Afera Williams. His maiden address to that committee was to find a suitable government system that is akin to the military organogram where power flow from the commander-in-chief. And that's what you have in the, in the executive presidential system. Executive presidential system is very unsuitable for a country like ours, which is an indigenous country with indigenous people, an heterogeneous society with different religion, different languages, different customs, different traditions, different artifacts, different folklore, different morals, different morals, etc. The parliamentary system upon which we secured our independence remains most suitable for us mm. and is cost effective because you will have only one election. Every federal constituency will be contested for by members of different political parties. A, a, part, a party that has the highest number of elected people will have their leader whom they will promote to be the, uh, uh, the, uh, the leader of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the house. And then the titular president will call upon him to form government. It is among these legislators that have been elected they will create a cabinet out of that parliament which will now become executive. So all of them will debate, they will resolve matters which the cabinet will go and implement. And because the, the ministers are, are equal members of the cabinet, Mm. All matters pertaining to each constituency that are brought into, into, into the parliament will be discussed in the presence of the ministers. So it makes for faster, quicker resolution of, of events. The, the prime minister who is the head of government is not far away. He's a member of the parliament. Yeah. Mm. And so government work 
is done in such a way that makes the government to be much more relevant, much more responsive to the yearning and the aspirations of the people. It is not the, like the current one, where once the governor is elected, he has no he has no reason again to go to, to visit the, 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 the legislature. The president, as soon as he is elected, on, on, until the time that he comes to lay down his budget, that's the time that he, he interacts. Or, or, they, or, 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 or unless they have their private interactions. Mm. Mm. And it makes the executive presidential system to be too prohibitive, very or, or, or irresponsive and irresponsible too. And there's nothing anybody can do about it. Mm. Yeah. In the American system, which they copied, the Congress and this, uh, that is the House of Rep and, and the Senate is so uniquely positioned and it's been very, very effective in, in serving as a, uh, a check, an effective check on the executive. Not more, not, not in the Nigeria, in the Nigeria setting. I agree with you, sir. Uh, that the parliamentary system of government will serve Nigeria better. And good thing, uh, there is a bill that is currently on in the House of Representatives that is uh, working on bringing the parliamentary system back. But I wanted to ask you a question on how political parties are funded today. What we see is that political parties use the nomination uh, process to raise money. So for instance, uh, for the presidential election, a, a political party, we ask the aspirants to bring as much as a hundred million, 150 million, and, and, and so much, you know, so that they, before they can run in the primaries. Now I wanted to ask you, was this the way it was done in the Second Republic? Is this the proper way to fund political parties? No. Uh, yeah, what they, are, what they have done here eh, is to encourage pol uh, political aspirants to go and organize themselves uh, as armed robbers, to go and break into the central bank vaults and bring that money. Since they know that they will have to bribe the, 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 the electorates to vote for them, by putting 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 naira into their, 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 they've even gone, they, they've even go, gone, uh, digital now that, that they can distribute, uh, ATM card, ATM card with money to, to people. They, they go, they, they, they have to bribe the electoral officers to the tilt. They have to bribe the judiciary. In order for them to be pronounced as winners, yeah. so it is a it's a total bizarre thing, a situation where people leaders are no more elected by people for a particular period of time. It, it remains and uh, it remains an, an inglorious situation. Mm. Come to think of it, come to think of it. Yes, sir. No one governor, no one governor in the Second Republic who said that he, said he spent 10,000 naira of his own money to become a governor in any of the Yobo states. Mm. By your antecedents and your participation, the party lead leaders will decide who will be the governorship candidates. Who will be the presidential candidate? And then once you are, once you are nominated that way, it is the, it's the duty of the party to fund the, the political process, the campaign and the likes. Nobody again will be going to organize bazaar entertainment for anybody because you are attending rallies. Mm. Nobody will, will really, and then the, the party leaders, they know how to find 
effective, reliable, trustworthy uh, 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 agents to man the polling post for them. But today, everything is about money. The highest bidder. Before you can contest election, some of our leaders who are in position of authority, they'll be asking, is he, is he, is he, uh, 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 is he uh, 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 fully loaded? Mm. Does he have the, the resources? Otherwise, you are not, you are not fit and proper to be, to be able to run. So we are not having the best among us to, to run for political office. Mm. Thank, thank, thank you very much. You know, uh, just a last question um, uh, on that, you know, and then I, I'll let you go, uh, Mr. Padukun. So what do you think we can do to correct that practice that you have just described in the parties? Must we uh, uh, make an amendment to the electoral laws in such a way that parties are disallowed from raising funds that way the, mil that? the military undermined us and they're still undermining us. But the military, when, the military when, is no more in power. When Babangida politics came and he asked us to go and form political parties, we formed different political parties. My own party, People Solidarity Party, was number one. We never gave money to anybody. People just brought in their resources. They opened offices in their different states, employed party apparatchik to run the offices. But since the, the military came and said it was forming two political parties, so they monetized and commercialized party politics. What can be done, mm -hmm. in my suggestion, is that we need to go back to, to the uh, critical base from which we were cigared by the military people ought to be allowed to fund their political parties without the intervention of the state nothing stops anybody a group of people in a local government to form a political party of, the, of, their, of, their, of their choice and campaign to, do, to run the local government in a particular way and if the people in that, that local government believe, believe in them, they win. Mm. So, but a situation where you say you must have political offices in two thirds of the state of the, of, of the country. What you are asking people to do is the impossible. That is why you are you, you you fine. Many, uh, you, you, you find many decent people who are interested in, in party politics today, and it's to the, to, to the shame of, of, of Nigeria. Okay, thank, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yopaloku, for coming to Inside Sources, and thank you so much for your uh, contributions. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, yeah. it's a pleasure. Yeah, and it's good to know uh, that the president is engaged actively on the issue of the constitution and uh, many of us believe that if there is one thing that president Tinubu will do for nigeria it will be a new constitution welcome back to inside sources on this segment we are going to have a deepened uh, conversation on the future of nigeria and in this segment i have uh, two guests Joining us virtually from Lagos, we have Okweyemi Adamoleku, the executive director of Enough is Enough Nigeria, and the 2022 winner of the Global Citizen Prize. Uh, Okweyemi, you are welcome to Inside Sources. Thank you. Here with me in the studio, we have Malam Baba Yusuf, uh, the, the group chief executive officer of Global Investment and Trade Company who is also a strategist, a policy analyst, and a newspaper columnist. Madam Baba Yusuf, welcome back to Inside Sources. Thank you for having me here again, Prof. Good All to right. be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right, so let's start with uh, Okoyemi. Now, if you take a look at where the country is today, 
And I want you to take, uh, you know, uh, a, a comprehensive look at the government, the people, and the various sectors of the Nigerian life. Are we all going in the same direction? And then, is it the right direction to bring a great Nigeria? Okay, Well, I mean, thank you. And it's, it's an interesting question because to determine if we're going in the right direction, there needs to be some uh, benchmark for what that direction is. So have we decided that we want to go north, or we've decided we want to go west, or we've decided we want to go east, or we've decided we want to go south? So as far as I know, I'm not quite sure that there's a clarity that we have as Nigerians decided in what direction we're going. So in the absence of a agreed objective, agreed target, agreed direction, I can only say that we'll only, just by nature of humanity, we'll all be going in different directions because we're, where there's not an agreed target, not an agreed destination. That's the word I'm looking for. So in that regard, I don't even think we can then make an assessment of if it's the right direction because we haven't decided where we're going. Mm. Okay, so I'm going, I'm going to come back uh, to follow up on that. But uh, let's hear uh, from Malam the same question. Uh, what's your take? Well, I think there is need for us to reevaluate uh, how far we have come and how we really need to move forward as a nation. There is this notion by Nigerians majorly that, um, which is li largely so, but not completely so, that um, the progress of Nigeria should be hinged or placed on the shoulders of a segment of a particular people, i.e. quote and unquote the leaders, mm -hmm. and whether they are political leaders, traditional leaders, what not, especially in this particular instance, the political leaders. I'm a proponent of what I have been, what I've coined to call the leadership value chain. And I believe, uh, to, to come back to your question, are we moving in the right direction? I think there is need for us to adjust the direction at which we are going. One of the key things that will redirect that movement is the amendment of the 1999 constitution, which has been kickstarted. Mm. Uh, the socioeconomic malaise in this country even though largely, you know, is placed on the shoulders of those that has aspired and have gotten the position of power from president to leaders as subnational along the arms of leadership. I dare say also part of the key uh, cause causative agents of where we are in regard with regards to the slow motion and trajectory of our development is the citizens of this country. And within that context, I would like to, you know, quote, you know, one very interesting, you know, excerpt of an article written in 2020, 2013 by a renowned Indian author mm -hmm. and philanthropist, Mrs. Rohini Lelekani, right. uh, which talked with me, you know, she says, and I quote, we cannot be mere consumers of good governance. We must be participants. We must be co-creators. Mm -hmm. As citizens, we have to co-create good governance. We cannot outsource it and hope it to be passive and hope to be passively happy consumers. Like everything worth its while, good governance must be earned. Okay. We are all leaders, end of quote. We are all leaders in our various spheres and our various, you know, in various strata of society, prof. And uh, if you see what has been happening, if you take this particular administration from you know inception to date, right. and all the activities that have happened within the context of leadership value chain, within the political class, you will agree with me, what I call the focal point leader is not enough to drive a positive change, i.e. the president or the leaders are subnational. Indeed, he is a driver, but there is need for what I call the collectiveness of the leadership value chain for Nigeria to be redirected. And that is why to land in this particular instance, I call on Nigerians not to be armchair critics, you know, and participants, but to be actively, you know, participating in the redirection of Nigeria. One of the key you know, components of that is the amendment of the 1999 constitution. Okay. The elites of this country need to understand that unless you participate in the political process, mm -hmm. whether it is in elections, whether it is in participate in amending the constitutions, right. then we cannot sit back and start blaming the political class. Whereas most of the people with due respect in the National Assembly do not have subject matter expertise or content to actually craft the laws in a way and manner that would push Nigeria or move Nigeria right. in the right direction. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that opening statement. So I want to come back to uh, to, to Jeremy. So you spoke about the fact that we had not even agreed 
uh, regarding the direction that we want to go. Uh, so, so Yemi, do you want to uh, give a little bit more detail on that, particularly uh, why you think that we are not agreed, and how do we agree, or don't we have to agree? Oh, we certainly have to agree, and I'll pick up where the other guests left off in terms of you can't be mere consumers of good governance, and I agree 100%. And that's why the organization that I work with leads on this campaign called Office of the Citizen. Mm. So we tend to defer power to Office of the President, Office of the Governor, because obviously uh, well, the Office of the President is the highest elected office in the country. Mm. So we tend to defer power because we say we elected them and they have power, quote unquote. But at the heart of the matter, that the power actually lies with citizens. And the Constitution says that. I don't remember the exact frame off the top of my head, but to mm -hmm. the Nigerian constitution true. is there. True. True. But it talks about the fact that citizens have power and that people we elect into office have power in trust. Mm. So to the point that we're not, cannot be mere consumers that we must co-create, and that's the whole idea. So for those that we've elected or get appointed into office, they have power because we have ceded power to them in the sense that, I mean, the three of us, if we want to agree on if we're eating fried rice, jollof rice, or fada rice, or whatever other rice there is, it might take a while. Mm. But so we appoint people who make decisions on the, ideally, for the collective, for the collective good in the in the interest of the majority of the people. But I think we can't escape the fact that even though we're twenty five years in into Nigeria's this this republic, there's nothing in Nigeria's structure, be it curriculum or engagement, that teaches Nigerians what a democracy means. Mm. The only reason why you can co-create good governance in this context is that's how a democracy should be practiced. We say a democracy is a system of government for the people, by the people, of the people. But if the people don't understand they have power, they can't demand it and they can't exercise that power. And it seems in my view that the way the Nigerian sort of governance structure is, is set up, it's for people not to know they have power. So if you don't know it's your right, you won't demand for it. So the whole concept of the office of the citizen is that there are rights and responsibilities of citizenship. Now, we can have a whole other kind of conversation about does every Nigerian feel like they are a citizen of this country? So, and this goes back to the initial point about are we going in the same direction? I would say, and I will say it very clearly, that there are some Nigerians in Nigeria today who do not believe that they are treated as equals in this national construct. And that's why my dear friend Aisha Yusufu would say that no Nigerian is more Nigerian than the other. Mm. That's true in theory. But in practice, I dare say that's not true. And we see it in everything from the judiciary, from our educational system, from our healthcare system, um, from even on the roads. I mean, you depending on where you are and you're driving, you can be literally shooed off the road because somebody else that has a car that's deemed to be more expensive wants to pass. So we have multiple layers on why these things are problematic. The issue of citizenship, the issue of understanding what it means to be a citizen, even if, let's say, we all are, and what that confers on you in terms of power, and then the idea of co-creating governance. How do you co-create governance when the people that you've elected into office or were appointed into office are unapproachable or unreachable? So during elections, everybody is campaigning, there's a lot of noise. Now we want to amend the constitution. It's a full page ad in the paper. If you happen to be on social media, you might see it. But the same people that spent millions of Naira campaigning to different local governments and talking to people now want to amend a doc and I'm using the constitution as an example. Right. Now want to amend what in a sense is the, is the Bible or the Quran of the mm. country, like what all of us work with. And it's just a few press statements and just everybody should just know that we are amending the constitution. And then lastly, I'll land on that, amending the constitution. It's a yearly, like a, not a yearly, it's a, every assembly has a budget to amend the constitution. So we just do it. It's a thing that we do. It's a right of passage. It's a way to spend money. We do hearings. We spend money on adverts. We do convenings. We spend money on lobbying as people pass. And obviously to amend the constitution, it's not just in Abuja. We have to get the state governments involved. So we're doing, so we're doing all of that. And it's just motion, 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 activity, activity, activity. Are we going to continue to do this every four years? We'll amend our constitution because that's now what we do. Why? Because again, it goes back to my original point. We're not agreed on what it is that we are doing and why we are doing it. 
And so we've had, and I think, I mean, and this is not to say that we need yet another national conference or yet another national conversation, because at the heart of why we keep going back at these things is a dishonesty with ourselves about what it is we're doing and why, and what this construct of Nigeria means. Um, we have 36 states. It's technically a federation, but we see that our, our cent like the central government keeps amassing more and more power when technically it should be dissolving power so states can, can do their thing. So if Enugu is not working for me, but Kaduna has better policies for my government, they're more welcoming for what I want to do, my children can go to school, school I'll up and move from Enugu and go to Kaduna. But then we talk about indigenship. And what's, that, what's the other thing we call, call those things? What's local government? What's state, state of origin? Mm. And we start discriminating against ourselves within that, yet we say we are one country. So many issues and a, quite a good, healthy dose of dishonesty. No, it's not healthy. A, a unhealthy dose of dishonesty about what we're doing. I, I, I want to hear uh, final points, uh, uh, starting from uh, uh, Yemi. But let me, let me also put this in, if you are able to... Uh, include it in your concluding remarks, uh, Yemi. I, is it not in the best interest of the elites, you know, uh, points were made by uh, Malam here, is it not in their best interest to sort this country out rather than uh, use poverty as a weapon uh, to dull the people leading to all kinds of uh, tension in, in society? You know, if, if you can take that along with your closing comments, uh, Yemi. Certainly. I think when enough is enough started, that was my, what's the word? That was my theory of change. Let me put it that way. My simple understanding was that if we get the elites to understand the nexus between governance and their well-being, that in their enlightened self-interest, they will engage and they would participate. They will be interested in the caliber of people who are put forward to run for office. They'll be interested in engaging. Um, I mean, we've spent the last, what, eight, 12 years doing exchange rates as people have gone abroad to school. All of my friends that went to public secondary schools will not send their children to public secondary school uh, because of the quality. So my thought was that if we can get them to remember their growing up, what they benefited from the country, how Nigeria was at a certain point in time, that that interest will get them, or that nostalgia, shall I say, will mm. get them to pay attention. But honestly, that hasn't, been, that hasn't been my experience. My experience has been almost a, a desire to continue to succeed in spite of and despite of. So as long as they are doing well and they can either attach themselves to government or private sector seems to be working well for them, that has been the trajectory. And unfortunately, you then have uh, religious institutions as well who have almost dulled people's minds so that we're waiting for a God. I mean, Islam is slightly different just by the nature of the, of the faith in terms of uh, being a bit more, like, like, um, there's an English word for it that escapes me. English is not my first language. So there's <laughs> being a bit more around as Allah wills. Mm. But Christianity is a bit more active in the sense that you can design and you can change your surroundings. So, but this whole notion that God, be Allah, be the Christian God will come and solve everybody as God wills, God is in control. And it's also in our language, God did, it is well. And all the things that we say that literally numbs us from taking action. Mm. So yes, do I think the elites have a role to play? A great role to play. And they should in their own enlightened self-interest. Because the more Nigeria faces challenges, the more people knock on your door for support, mm. the more we have security issues to contend with and you are the target because you are the ones who live in the houses, drive the cars and seem to have the things that people who don't have aspire to. So if maybe not the fact that you want the country to be good for everyone, maybe in your own desire to protect yourself from a security perspective, but find a reason to want Nigeria to work. But, and I'll end on this because if we then maybe end on this positive note, when Nigeria succeeds, be it at a football match, be it on the world stage with Afro beats or fashion, we're all very proud. Mm. We're all very proud to say, I am Niger. We're all very proud to say that this is from us. Mm. This is us. This is Niger. We know they carry last. So we carry that braggado and that it cuts across every socioeconomic strata mm. that we are proud of what we produce and how the world sees us. But 
for that to be sustainable in a country that's struggling with so much, we must fix our leadership and governance issues because it is out of the people who we say represent us as leaders on the world stage that are making policies, that are thinking 20, 30 years ahead and planning ahead. You cannot have a country that doesn't plan. So if you have people that are about now and what they can get now when they're in office and are not having casting a plan, i.e. a direction for where we're going for the next 20, 30 years, this thing is unsustainable. No matter how we're saying we're Niger, we know they carry last too. It is unsustainable. So let's use our Niger, we know they carry last to actually be interested mm. in doing the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Yemi. Uh, final point, madam. Well, citizens should co-create good governance. The elites should understand that um, even if you are in a bubble or you japa, your roots are Nigeria. Mm. And if Nigeria becomes better, then your descendants will be proud of you. If Nigeria you know, becomes otherwise, then you will answer to that before God. When we say, you know, as Allah wills, and Allah has given us responsibility, mm. like Jesus has directed our actions. Mm. Unless we do that, we are actually not professing even the religion we claim we are professing. Mm. So we should move away from these actions so that we can be able to move from hypocrisy, I call hypocrisy of our expectations right. to sure-footedness, forward thinking, you know, kind of people that are the elites that drive a society. We are the cohesive forces between the political class or the leadership class, politics, and, uh, religious and traditional, and the masses. We have a core responsibility. If Nigeria gets better, it is you and I and our ties, Prof. And if Nigeria continues to move into the abyss of backwardness, it is still our responsibility. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, um, Malam uh, Baba Yusuf, uh, a Group CEO of Global uh, trading and investment company, uh, also a policy analyst. And thank you so much, Okoyemi uh, Adamolekun, uh, the executive director of Innov is Enough. Thank you both for coming uh, to Inside Sources. Thank you for having me. And that is another edition of Inside Sources. Nigeria will prevail. Don't forget, hashtag Nigeria will prevail. Join me again next week by God's grace. My name is Laulu Akonde. Mm -hmm.